So as the uh, title speaks, I'm going to talk about waves in the lower solar atmosphere and uh, with a particular focus on ALMA. Uh, but before starting to talk about uh, this, uh, some scientific results, I thought to start with some basic uh, uh, introduction as we have also non-solar physicists uh, in the, among the uh, audience. So I start with this uh, big question, this uh, one of the, um, so a long standing question in solar physics, long standing problem has been about the heating of the solar atmosphere. So what I mean by that is uh, if we look at the uh, solar atmosphere, here is what the picture I'm showing. It also shows uh, some internal structure in this cartoon. And we have here the solar uh, surface as we define it as a surface of the sun based on the opacity. So if we start to uh, go outward from the solar surface in a very uh, simple model that I'm showing here, this is a one dimensional model, which can describe uh, fairly uh, the uh, behavior of the uh, solar atmosphere on average uh, in reality in the dynamic zone, it can be different from location to location. But in this uh, one dimensional model, we can see that the density uh, decreases all the way from the solar surface, which is here, it's a zero here in the plot, uh, outwards uh, through the atmosphere. So does the pressure, both pressure and density decreases very rapidly uh, through the atmosphere. So we would expect that in general, the temperature should also uh, follow the same trend, uh, but it doesn't. As we can see here, the red plot here, the red curve shows the temperature variation through the solar atmosphere. So the temperature starts to decrease within the first few hundred kilometers on average around up to 500 kilometers. And then from there, the temperature, which is on average around 4,000 Kelvin, start to increase uh, first shallower, shallowly, like up to about 15, 20,000 Kelvin within the so-called chromosphere. So this is the second distinct layer of the atmosphere that we can define in this uh, simple model. And then from the upper chromosphere, the temperature start to increase suddenly from tens of uh, thousand Kelvin to few hundred uh, of thousand uh, Kelvin and uh, eventually to a uh, million Kelvin in the lower corona. So this uh, very uh, relatively thin layer uh, of the atmosphere, which is sandwiched between the chromosphere and the corona is so-called transition region, is where the, uh, the temperature uh, increases very rapidly to million degrees. So why the temperature is increasing to those uh, very high uh, degrees is the question, is the long standing question in solar physics the last few decades, solar physicists have, have been trying to answer this question. So there have been many different mechanisms have been uh, proposed. Uh, one of those is uh, the, uh, through the magnetic reconnection, so-called uh, DC heating mechanism, which is due to the reconfiguration of the magnetic field. So due to this reconfiguration, some explosion can happen, some energy can release, such as this uh, one that I'm showing in this example, in this movie from the Irish satellite. You can see that uh, this explosion accuracy here, and you can see that this release of energy at this very huge flare uh, that uh, happens uh, just right now here. Yeah. You can see, yeah, like here, and then, yeah, that's the old energy is releasing. So this is not what I'm going to talk about. It's one of the mechanisms, as I said, which, is, which has been suggested for these uh, heating mechanisms. And the second uh, mechanism that I'm going to focus on is uh, due to waves, waves and oscillatory processes or so-called AC heating mechanisms. So this uh, waves and oscillation that we can see in example here that I'm showing, uh, what I'm showing here is the upper chromosphere of a sunspot. So in the upper chromosphere in sunspot, here is in the line core of calcium to 8542 uh, channel. We can see these waves, this, uh, this uh, flashes that is coming up in the center of the sunspot. We can see these flashes, like the, which are magnetic waves and you can see these waves, which is propagating outwards towards the sides. So this, this kind of waves is one example of the wave, the type of waves that we can observe in the solar atmosphere. So there are different types of waves. I mean, that's, uh, that I'm listing here, a couple of those like acoustic waves, which is basically pressure uh, perturbations, uh, like P modes. It's uh, like, a, and we have gravity waves or we have magnetic waves, such as what I'm showing here or magnetohydrodynamic waves. So these actually could be together so magnetic fields could guide these waves, the acoustic waves, such as magnetoacoustic waves or magnetoacoustic gravity waves and such. I'm not going into detail of the, all those different types. I'm not going into, into details of different wave modes. I'm introducing a few of those now. I'm just, uh, that I'm going to talk about a little bit later and I'm showing some uh, scientific results uh, from, particularly from ALMA. 
So here is what I'm showing in this image is this is the sun spot as I said in this large scale structure magnifier. But we can also look at the magnet this this kind of magnetohydrodynamic waves, magnetoacoustic wave in the small scale structures. So here is an example of a small scale structure. What I'm talking about, I hope you can see it also on your screen here. What what I'm showing here is uh, the uh, the super surface. Uh, then you can see all this granulation pattern here, which is the topmost uh, part of the uh, convection zone. And in between, if you look at it very closely, in between this granulation, you can see this uh, small dots, bright dots or bright points, which are actually a manifestation of the magnetic field concentration. So we have magnetic field concentration, which in intensity images are seen as these uh, bright, bright features, small bright uh, points. So here is an example, an image here that I'm showing. So here are the granulation again, this still Im image, and you can see this properly. You can see this very tiny features here in between. We can also do the magnetic field measurements, particularly very accurately in the photosphere. And so we can do that in chromosphere uh, to some degrees. Uh, so here, what I'm showing, this contours, both red and uh, yellow, show the uh, location of the magnetic field concentrations. Uh, with the different polarity, which means the magnet, which shows the direction of the magnetic fields. So if we look at one of those only here, this, uh, this is a small feature here. As I said, this is a proxy for the magnetic field concentration. And the magnetic field is expanding, extending into the atmosphere. And what we see here, this like the field lines that I'm showing in this cartoon, which is exaggerated, by the way, in terms of the uh, also size. Uh, so it's expanding when it goes higher up in the atmosphere because the gas um, density and pressure are decreasing from the surface outward and the magnetic pressure start to dominate the gas pressure when we go higher up in the atmosphere. So these bundles of the magnetic field lines are uh, so-called uh, flux tube. It's just a proxy for this magnetic field concentration. And if we observe this, uh, another layer of the solar atmosphere, a little bit higher up, for instance, what I'm showing here, it's in the low chromosphere, upper photosphere, low chromosphere. We can again see this bright structure here, bright feature. If you look at it at the time series of images that we can see they even move together with some shift possibly. That these basically are thought to be a cross, -sec cross section of these uh, flux tubes in the atmosphere. So these bright points are considered as the proxies for the magnetic field concentration at different layer of the atmosphere. But the magnetic field lines are not just uh, extending through the atmosphere just, just vertically, as we could see here, or close to vertical. But when it goes higher up, it starts to bend over. So this bend overing of the magnetic field that I will show it uh, in a minute in another slide in intensity images can be seen as so-called fibrodal structures. So this is what we observe in intensity images that are thought to be manifestation of the magnetic field, which is bent over in the higher up in the atmosphere. So these flux tubes or the concentration of the magnetic fields are very important to be detected because then we can also look at the waves and oscillation along them. So two types of waves, the magnetic waves, these are the magnetic uh, uh, fields and we can look at the magnetic wave or magnetoacoustic waves. And so I show here two modes of the wave that I'm going to talk about. Again, not going to show all those different modes because then it could be uh, complicated uh, and we don't want to, get to go through all those different things. So here is one of the modes, so-called uh, kink mode. So the kink wave that uh, we're talking about here, so it's a kind of swaying motion. So we can see that the wave is like a swaying motion, is propagating here along this uh, theoretical uh, ideal cylinder here. And we can see that it just uh, pushed the, push the uh, flux tube here. We can see different cr uh, cross section. Here is from the top, here is from the side, push to, towards the edges, the, to the sides. If we look at the uh, another modes, uh, for instance, uh, this one so-called sausage mode. So we can see the flux tube is uh, contracting and expanding. So this contraction and exp expansion of the flux tube causes this uh, so-called let me call it sausage mode. And this is another type of mode, another wave mode. And it's very important to be able to identify these different type of wave modes when we do the observation since they can also carry, is important for the energy uh, they can carry and the energy they can release at different uh, heights in the atmosphere. So one of the main studies that we do about these waves is how these waves are generated, how these waves are propagated, if they propagate at all, because it can be also like a standing wave, or 
how these waves are um, dissipating their energy, releasing their energy at different height in the atmosphere if they do, which is the most important part for us to, to understand the seating problem. So the, when we look at here, the sun, the different layer of the sun here, of course, from Corona is the outer layer. When we look at, when we look at the different wavelength, looking at, through the uh, different layer of the solar atmosphere, here is the, some images from the SEO. So as I said, we are looking at this so-called flux tube or magnetic field concentration of different sizes of different uh, scales. So we do have like the sun spots or a small scale structure and we want to look at these waves or how the waves globally oscillates through the solar atmosphere. So if we look at this cartoon again, so we have this uh, such a like a flux tube or flux magnetic uh, concentration. So this, uh, we, 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 can, we can find, we can identify different modes there. We can see these temperature perturbations or like shock waves that we can find at different region outside or inside the magnetic concentrations. The shock waves are basically the waves, the acoustic waves, which are propagating from the lower height when their amplitude also grows uh, with height. And then uh, the uh, eventually um, dissipate, they, they eventually uh, form the shocks. So in the, the higher uh, chromosphere or mid-chromosphere. So uh, this is what we want to look at, but how we can detect them, how we can observe them, it's very important how we plan our observation. So there are different key parameters when you want to observe this, uh, the solar atmosphere. So these, if, uh, these features here also evolve very fast. So it's a matter of few seconds. So they have a lifetime of very, they, some of those have a very short lifetime or evolve very, very quickly. So the key parameters for these observations are as listed here, some of the most important one probably, the temporal resolution, the cadence, which is the time between the consecutive frames that we record, the spatial resolution, if we want to identify, if we want to resolve very small scale structures, multi-line observation, which means multi-height observation. If we want to trace this wave through the atmosphere, we would need to observe this wave at different heights in the atmosphere. But if we do that, then we would probably lose the temp temporal resolution. So this is where the comp compromises come uh, into action. So it, we cannot usually have all these different set up together. So it's very difficult with the current instrument to satisfy all these different needs uh, that we have all the different parameters that I list here. Another thing, of course, is also the, the, the accuracy of the measurements when it comes when we want to have a very high signal to noise then in that case, we, we need to do the longer integration, which means again, that you would lose some temporal resolution. So these are some, just I'm giving some ideas that uh, different instrument uh, could provide us different advantages. And uh, it could be some other disadvantages if we want to do one uh, setup uh, over another setup. So that's very important also to use different instruments, also to combine different instruments to be able to uh, get all those, uh, parameters satisfied. So just to give you one, uh, another example before I, I move uh, to uh, a study from Alma. Uh, so this is uh, what I'm talking about, this multi-wavelength observation. So I'm showing an example here from the Swedish Solar Telescope SST, so a high resolution telescope that uh, does the, uh, the observation of the, uh, the, the, the lower part of the atmosphere, photosphere, chromosphere, at uh, different wavelengths. So basically we can sample all these different layers uh, simultaneously uh, at a very high resolution. So here are a few examples, just spectral lines that I'm listing here, like the iron lines, which is mostly photospheric line. And then we have the like, calcium 8542 H alpha, which can scan through the photosphere and chromosphere and also the calcium 2K. So what I mean by scanning is what I'm showing here uh, in this plot here, that you can see that this here is the line, the spectral line. So this is a 65, 62, the HL4 line. And if we observe with this uh, narrow band filters at different wavelength position, in principle, we are looking at different height in the atmosphere. So basically, if you look at this granulation here and this bright point in between the bright features, bright structures, the magnetic field concentration. And if you go higher up, you can see all this fiber structure. This is what I was showing earlier in this cartoon. Uh, that the magnetic field, when it goes to the higher up, the magnetic field starts to bend over and it's thought that to be, um, to be uh, mapping this fibrillary structure that we can see in the uh, intensity images. So this is one example that what I'm talking about, uh, this different multi-line multi, uh, uh, observation. But if we do this scanning, of course, then uh, it comes with the expense of uh, losing some temporal, uh, 
resolution. So when we do this uh, observation, just another example for a sunspot this time that uh, when we do, I mean that, uh, so here is the base of the photosphere. So when we go higher up in the atmosphere, basically we are uh, looking at different heights, different wavelength position. Here you can see that the uh, fibrillary structure is start to appear here. Some of the strat like structures at different parts. So then when you go higher up in the atmosphere, so they become thicker, thicker and denser. And then we go higher up and higher up then into the higher chromosphere. So this is what we want to do if we want to trace the waves in the atmosphere. As I said, I mean, that it's very necessary, very important to be able to trace the waves if we want to see how they evolve with height. But again, in that case, we may have a, uh, we may have a worse uh, uh, temporal resolution. So there we, we are losing cadence in most cases, uh, in most, uh, using most uh, instrumentation uh, will be the case. So this is the intensity image. But as I was mentioning earlier, that many of these waves are related to or linked to magnetic fields. So it's very important also to be able to measure the magnetic field very accurately, because it can also tell us what's going on in the chromosphere, the chromosphere which is dominated by the magnetic field, the magnetic field start to fill the entire volume in the chromosphere. So it's very important to be able to look at the oscillation of the magnetic field as well, or to see how the oscillation that we observe in intensity images are described by the uh, configuration of the magnetic field. For that, as I said, we can measure also the magnetic field. So the magnetic field that we can observe simultaneously here for the same data set that I was showing at different height here, I'm showing the magnetic field measurements, which is done uh, by the uh, fullest Stokes observation, polarimetry observations of the uh, iron line 6301, 6302 angstrom. And uh, we have done some uh, so-called inversion uh, um, treatments to be able to uh, calculate this uh, magnetic field uh, at the photosphere. So what uh, I'm showing here is the, uh, the intensity image, so-called Stokes I. And when we compute the magnetic field, here I'm showing the different components of the magnetic field. This is the Bx, it's one of the components, one the, of the vector magnetic field we have, By, Bz, and then we have the total magnetic field. So this is a magnetic field as strength, what I'm showing here, and here is what I'm showing is just so-called magnetic field inclination angle. Inclination, which is the angle uh, between the magnetic field lines and the normal uh, to, surface, to, to the surface, uh, which uh, here the color codes is in a way that the, uh, the blue uh, shows the more vertical. So we have a more vertical field at the center of this spot. And uh, the red is a very horizontal. So if we have a very, very vertical to very horizontal field. So this is what we have at the base of the photosphere. But when we extrapolate this using some sophisticated techniques for the chromosphere, then uh, we can get the magnetic field configuration in the entire atmosphere. So this is what we get in the entire atmosphere. So the magnetic field lines, as you can see, that they start to bend over. This is what I was showing in the cartoon earlier, that the magnetic field is rooted in a strong magnetic field in the photosphere. And when they, they go, when they go to, uh, to the higher heights, they start to bend over. So this is, uh, the colors also is the same as inclination. If they show inclination angle, when they are blue, they show more vertical. And then when they are red, they show more uh, horizontal fields. So this is very important, as I say, not only look at the oscillation in intensity, but also looking at the magnetic field or see how the magnetic field can describe the oscillation that we observe because they are linked to the magnetic field that we are observing there. So this is uh, what uh, thought to be a good introduction uh, to describe why it is important uh, to have this different setup, these different uh, observations and why we need also to have the magnetic field observation to be able to explain uh, the oscillatory pattern that we observe. By that, I come to all my observation now. I, wouldn't, I would like to show also some other results from the uh, other telescopes, uh, but since uh, the time is limited uh, and the focus is on ALMA, then I move to the uh, solar observation with ALMA. So ALMA is one of the largest astronomical facilities uh, located in Chile. Sorry, that's so uh, in the uh, located in um, Chile in Atacama Desert at the 5,000 meter altitude. It's a collaboration between uh, many institutions and uh, it does the observation in millimeter wavelengths. So it is just a start to do the solar observation in December 2016, 
started the regular observation in 2013, but the solar observation started, the regular solar observation started in December 2016, and we have just got the data ready uh, to do the science. It's very exciting. I will tell you why, why it's important to use also ALMA as another instrument. So ALMA here uh, contains, uh, includes several different uh, dishes. So the antennas that we uh, do the observation in interferometry uh, regime. So if you can see here that we have uh, 50, uh, 12 meter antennas here. Uh, so 12 uh, fixed antennas, seven meter, this 50 uh, antennas are movable. So we can have a different configuration and based on the configuration and baseline, the resolution uh, is defined. So uh, Alma also has this four single spatial dishes uh, that are uh, used for this total power, so, so called uh, total power array, which is uh, used at the end uh, to calibrate the temperature. So in principle, the important uh, part about Alma is that the Alma observed, sorry, uh, Alma uh, is uh, formed under LTE formation. So under LTE condition, local thermodynamic equilibrium condition, which is opposite to uh, the normal diagnostic we have in the chromosphere, which are under non-LTE, that the interpretation for measuring the temperature, other physical parameter is more complicated. Therefore, we get directly the gas temperature, electron temperature, by observing uh, the solar chromosphere with ALMA. ALMA, in the near future, we do the um, polarimetry measurements. It doesn't do it at the moment. It will do the spectral line observation, which in those cases, we will have all the information we need for the physical parameters, the, the kinetic structure and magnetic structure in 3D for the entire chromosphere. But what at the moment it provides to us is about the uh, temperature measurements at a very high cadence. So what we get here, what I'm showing here is one of the very first data sets that we have observed with ALMA. So this is what here in this panel, you can see the ALMA in three millimeter. And the other panel here show the co-aligned uh, images from the SDO, Solar Dynamic Observatory, at different wavelengths from the base of the photosphere, the magnetic field, the magnetogram, and the, the, the low chromosphere at these two wavelengths. And then we have the ALMA in the chromosphere, which is complementary to the observation from SDO. And then we have the transition region and the higher atmosphere, higher corona at different channel. So what we get here in ALMA is much higher cadence than the, what we get in SDO. So here is two second cadence. So at a very high cadence, so we can look at the structure, the evolution of this feature at a very high cadence, high temporal resolution. To show, to, to, to show you some examples here, for instance, if we look at one of these uh, features here, that you can see this uh, structure here that is marked by this uh, uh, plus sign here, that uh, this, uh, this structure starts to, uh, to uh, get hotter or the brighter here, and then it starts again to get darker again. And all this actually happening within a few minutes. So here is a plot, just never mind the color here. And you can see that uh, the temperature starts to increase and it increases almost by 2000 Kelvin, which in about uh, seven, five minutes, four or five minutes in this regime. So this is, this is one of the example that I'm showing in the next slides. Uh, it's been considered as a shock event. It's a shock wave, which is uh, propagating in the solar chromosphere. So we could only observe this with this very high cadence. You can see the lifetime here is very, very short. Also, we could see also some uh, post shock events, for instance, I mean that here, that you can see in a very, very short time scale, within like two, three minutes, this, uh, this, this feature decreases the temperature by almost 1000 Kelvin and then increases again. So this is uh, one of the bases that we started to look at these waves. Uh, so this is the work by uh, Henrik Eklund, one of our PhD students here in uh, Oslo, that he has looked at this uh, dynamics of this very small scale structure at this very high cadence observation. So what we have here, so on the left, I'm showing in the bottom, this is the uh, saturated image from ALMA. So you can see the intensity here, the brighter structure here, the higher, the, the higher temperature region. And here on the top, uh, he has shown the magnetic field uh, strengths from the SDO. So you can see where the concentration of the magnetic field uh, exists. So it's a relatively quiet region of the solar atmosphere. So he's looked at this different uh, structure, different location, and he has looked at the uh, temperature profile. So here is the, uh, the light curve for one of the structures. And you can see the, uh, 
Temperature again increases by about almost uh, 1000 Kelvin within uh, 35 seconds. And then again, decreases within 35 seconds. And if we didn't have this two, two second cadence, we will not be able to identify clearly this variation with time. So this is one of the events that he has looked at. This is a possible shock events that uh, he has uh, found in the observation. And to be able to understand it, uh, he has done also further studies. So here is also the uh, statistics uh, from uh, many, many different uh, features that he has identified in these uh, structures. So in this uh, map, so what you can see here basically on the top is the uh, brightness temperature excess, so excess uh, temperature versus the lifetime of the features. So the features, as you can see here, if you just look at the, the, the left one, the left side one uh, panel here, top left, so you can see that uh, the lifetime is very short. So they're order of 90 seconds, 100 seconds on average. If you look at here in the bottom, this is which, is, which shows again the temperature excess versus the base temperature. So you can see actually how the uh, excess temperature varies for the uh, similar temperature at the base. So in this, these different panels here, what he's showing is uh, looking at the network and internetwork uh, regions separately which is pretty much similar to what we get for the entire field of view here. So the network and internet work, which are defined also by these contours here in this uh, image on the left. So what he has also done, he's looked at this structure in the Bifrost simulation. So to be able to understand what we're observing there, whether or not it's a shock event or not, the best way is to look at the simulation. So we have a sophisticated simulation uh, model here for the chromosphere from Bifrost that uh, what you can see here, is uh, showing one of this simulation, which has been synthesized for the millimeter wavelengths that Alma does the observation. And he has looked at uh, for this uh, structure, this, uh, this shock events that he could find in the observations. So here is one example here, for instance, which is marked by this circle. And you can clearly see here how the temperature uh, varies with time. And you can see the temperature varies actually much, the, the excess temperature is much larger than what we get from the ALMA observation. Here is the original resolution of also the, uh, the simulation. And it's also occurring in a very short time. But he has found a very similar signature as we could find in the observation. He's also looked at many different parameters here that I'm not going into details. Don't, I don't have time to go through. But one example that I'm showing here also is this shock events, how uh, it changes with height. And you can see why the shock is propagating, how the height is actually changing. Uh, quite a lot from about 800 uh, kilometer to uh, 1400 kilometer uh, at the uh, center of the shock. And then when the shock, uh, the temperature decreases again. So here you can see also in the background, the uh, gas temperature from the simulation in the, in the map. This is one of the examples that we could find for the dynamic of this small scale structure. There is another example, I mean, of the very recent work also done by another PhD student, uh, uh, Juan uh, Guevara, Guevara uh, Gomez, who has done this uh, study looking at the small scale structure and looking at the propagation of the uh, high frequency waves of different type of different uh, wave modes, the magnetic wave modes. So he has looked at this very tiny structures and he has looked at, I mean, here are three examples which are marked uh, in this HMI image. So the maps here are the, on the left is the ALMA, top left is the ALMA three millimeter uh, map. We have the magnetogram here, which is from the SDO HMI. So we have from SDO AIA, two different uh, maps. So 1700, which is formed lower than that of ALMA. So in the low uh, chromosphere, the ALMA, band three is formed supposedly in the, uh, on the mid chromosphere, upper chromosphere. And then we have the AIA 304 uh, channel, which is the transition region. So just for comparison, he has also plotted these different images that you can see how the uh, features are looked at different uh, heights in the atmosphere. So he has looked at these different features and these three that are marked with A, B, and C, we can see here the variation of different parameter. So what I'm showing here, he has looked at the uh, variation of the temperature, which is shown in black. And for these three different feature and the variation of the oscillation of the size of the size of this tiny feature. These are very small features. You can see the size here also in a uh, kilometer. So uh, the kilometer is around the, like an average uh, 1800 kilometer, the size of this feature, diameter of these features. So what is very interesting here that the temperature and size are anticorrelated. The, their oscillations are anticorrelated. 
So this is a very good indication of so-called sausage mode waves that I was introducing at the beginning. So this is one of the wave modes, sausage mode waves uh, we have in the um, solar chromosphere. So he has identified them as the fast sausage uh, modes in the chromosphere. He has also looked at the velocity of these uh, structures and uh, here are in the different directions uh, that is in X, Y and the total velocity. And you can see also that it's a very high frequency oscillation. So he has also quantified this, uh, these uh, oscillations in terms of periodicities, uh, frequency that they have and the relation between these different parameters while doing the phase lag analysis. And the, he has uh, identified this uh, kink and the sausage mode waves uh, in this uh, very small uh, structures, white structures from ALMA that we could do up to that very high frequency with this very high cadence observations gain. Rather than this very small scale structure, uh, which are very localized uh, in this observation, we have also looked at the uh, global oscillation. We want to see also how the oscillation in general in the entire field of view is. Um, so what we have done, what we expect, first of all, from the chromosphere, what we know from observation for decades is uh, that about three minutes oscillation, about uh, three to five millihertz uh, oscillations, are the dominating oscillation in the chromosphere. So this is what you would expect to see in the ALMA observation as well. And before ALMA started to do the observation, there were many simulations that uh, started to show uh, that we could see indeed those uh, three minute oscillation. So when we got this observation, the very first observation, we got a surprise. So we could not see those three minute oscillation at the beginning. So this is one of those data sets. This is one of the very first data set that I showed also earlier. So here, uh, again, I will talk about it. I will show this global oscillation within this uh, field of view that you can see also the temperature range here that I'm showing. So we want to see in the entire field of view, what is the average oscillation? On average, we look at the oscillation pixel by pixel, and we look at the average oscillation of the power spectra from the entire field of view. And also we look at the uh, dominant uh, frequency at each pixel. So we look at the map to see what's the spatial distribution of this, um, of this uh, oscillator pattern. So this is one of the data set I showed earlier also, and we look at also, I showed the studies uh, done uh, for the small scale structure on this data. So this is another example, another data set. So here is another wavelet, uh, another um, band of ALMA, so-called uh, band six, which is uh, around uh, 1.3 millimeter. So this is a two second cadence again. So this is the ALMA observation. And again, I have here co-alignment with other uh, instruments, so mostly from SDO, but here we have also iris, uh, um, iris observation. Here is the iris SDO image, and we have uh, in magnesium, we have also here the, uh, the slit um, images here. So here is the scan of the slit uh, within this uh, area. So we have it to two different, uh, just example here, two different uh, wavelets I'm showing here, and then we have the other channels from the SDO. So this is very important to be able to understand how the wave is propagating through the atmosphere to compare with different wavelengths. So this is what uh, I will show um, in a few minutes. So then I go back to the first data set that I showed. I'm going to show the uh, results of these uh, global wave studies that we have done. So here is uh, one uh, single frame from the same data set that I was showing uh, just earlier. So the same band three data set, three millimeter. So here we can see the K omega diagram. So we can see basically the average power spectra. Uh, we can see the frequency and you can see in the spatial scale or wave number you could refer. So we can see how the power is concentrated in the uh, different uh, spatial sizes. And here what we get, which is pretty much similar to what we have here, but it's just integrated uh, over the uh, wave number. So we get the uh, power spectra, the average power spectra uh, for the entire field of view. So we cannot see any enhancement, power enhancement in this uh, area that we would expect to see in the chromosphere based on most of the other chromospheric observations. So this was, this was the surprise that I was talking about. And here what we see also is a similar, also a plot in a different way to show it is a dominant frequency. So it's a frequency corresponding to the, um, to the maximum power, power spectra at each pixel. So we can see at some pixels, so we, we would, we do have some uh, higher frequency around three to five uh, millihertz, but not in the majority of the uh, field of view. 
So it's not dominating the field of view as we can not see also here in this power spectra. There are some small bumps, but they're not really enhanced power um, here. To be able to understand it, so we start to look at the magnetic field. As I was saying earlier, that it's very important to see what's the configuration of the magnetic field in this re region that we're observing. For the magnetic field, here is the uh, magnetic field uh, extrapolation, similar to what I was showing also earlier. So here is a top view of this uh, configuration. And what I'm showing here is not only the field of view of ALMA, but a larger field of view, extended field of view, which is very, very important when we're looking at the chromosphere. Because the magnetic field configuration that we are looking at, it's not only due to the magnetic field on, from underneath, but the magnetic field in the immediate um, vicinity as well, because this magnetic field, for instance here, that we have very strong magnetic field just outside the field of view. So there we have this vertical field here, but when they reach to the chromosphere, they have already bent over and we can see the, the effect here. So the magnetic field basically come inside the field of view and cover the entire field of view. So these are the magnetic fields coming from the outside uh, field concentration, not those including in the field of view that we're observing in the chromosphere. So we have, we, have, we have started to look at those and we have started to see if there is any link between those. So what we see here, the, we, have, we can see a very dense magnetic field coming from outside, although the magnetic field inside is very quiet and covering the entire field of view. So it, it was one of the things that we were thinking that this so-called magnetic canopy could basically uh, cover the entire uh, field of view. So we could not see any oscillation coming from the underneath from the lower heights. So we have this lack of three minutes oscillation here. So this is in one of the bands. So the second data set I was showing is band six. So we have a similar situation. So here is again, I mean, we have one of the snapshots here. And if you look at the power spectra in either of those or the dominant frequency maps, we do not see any enhanced power around three to five minute oscillation. Again, we have the lack of three to five minute oscillations. Again, the magnetic field here is a very different also scenario. We have not only outside, but inside also we have very strong field that when they come to the chromosphere, they bend over also, and they cover the entire field of view, except in those locations that we have a very, very vertical field here, that we do also have some higher frequency at those regions, but it's not so clear. Also, the strong magnetic field could suppress also the power at the higher heights. This is another thing that we have been considering to do to, to be able to explain what we are, we are observing here. So I just showed two more examples uh, very quickly uh, that we have a completely opposite uh, scenario here, opposite um, power spectra. So this is again in band three, similar uh, band, but the field of view is very different. Not only the field of view of observation, but the extended field of view doesn't have any, very, any strong magnetic field. Also, you should, have, you should also look at the range of the magnetic field here. It's a very, very quiet region. So we do have some magnetic field lines, of course. I mean, we do have this canopy, but much weaker and they're much more scattered. But here, we, what we could see, we could clearly see what we would expect from simulation and the older observations. We could indeed see this power enhancement on three to five millihertz, as we could see also here in the entire field of view. So this is one of the bands. I mean, if you go to the other band also, that we could not see any uh, three to five minute oscillation. But here again, we can see that. We can clearly see in this data set, a very clear enhanced uh, power on three to five millihertz. So these are the different ALMA data set that shows completely different behavior. It's completely different wave characteristics that is uh, very much new to us when we look at the solar chromosphere. So this, could be explained in different ways. This kind of wave, uh, this kind of magnetic canopy that acts as an umbrella and covering the wave coming. So it could be one of the explanation, but this is probably very early now to uh, conclude what's the exact mechanism is behind it. So um, here I'm showing uh, just a comparison from this uh, recent uh, paper, which is now in press. Uh, then we are comparing 10 different data sets. So I'm, I was showing, I mean, four different examples. So the power spectra from, from 10 different data sets, uh, the best 10 data sets we have got from almost so far. So in only two of those, the one that I showed, I mean, we could see enhancement in three to five millihertz. So we cannot see in any other, other data sets. So that's a surprise. Just for comparison, I'm showing from STO uh, 1600. Uh, so the co-observation with the 1600, the same field of view, the exact same time. So we can see in all of those actually, we can, we can see this enhancement. 
By the way, this is formed much lower in height in the atmosphere and much around low chromosphere, so around temperature minimum region. So to be able to understand, we have also started to look at the, uh, the, on the um, simulation. So this is a simulation again from Bifrost that I was showing earlier on a snapshot uh, from the work uh, of uh, Henrik. Uh, but here, what I'm showing is the simulation in the original uh, resolution of the simulation. So this is the time series of images for the synthetic uh, ALMA three millimeter band three. So here also, we could not see much of the um, three minute oscillations pretty much similar, but also we have very strong field here. These are, this is actually an enhanced net, so-called enhanced network simulation that we have two very strong magnetic field patches here that we can see these loops here connecting in principle this, uh, this very strong magnetic field concentrations here. If we also degrade it to the ALMA resolution, yeah, the resolution, the spatial resolution here, you can see it's, uh, it's, it's lower, even lower than, uh, than those observations I was showing at the beginning of my, my presentation. But the temporal resolution is uh, what we gain here. So uh, here is uh, the lower resolution, and still we do not see the actually the, uh, the amount of determinant oscillation decreases, which is closer to what we get from observation, which is one five to six percent. But so it could explain this, but it needs also um, for us to look at the other simulation with other magnetic configuration to see how the magnetic configuration can explain it. This is something which is under uh, progress at the moment. Another interesting thing before I come to my conclusion is this work uh, that they have compared the ALMA observation with H alpha observation. So they were lucky that they could do the observation uh, together with the H alpha uh, from uh, DST. Uh, and uh, what they got, I mean, they found uh, that this uh, Observation from ALMA is very much similar to the ALMA, to the H alpha line for H alpha um, uh, line weight uh, maps. So they could see a very a strong similarity between all this different structure, this different fibrillar structure in the two maps here. So this is very interesting because of two reasons. One is that this uh, umbrella effect that we were talking about has been seen before at least twice, as far as I know. Uh, in H alpha observation. So people have seen in H alpha line for observation this suppression of the three minute oscillation. So that in H alpha line for intensity also, we could, they could not find any three minute oscillation as we would expect. So it could be a similar effect that we can see here. Also, the other thing is that in H alpha also, we have a significant variation of height. If it is similar to ALMA, if we would have this significant height variation, it could basically destroy the oscillatory pattern. So these two different also uh, speculation, also we can learn from this study and uh, from the similarity of the ALMA and H alpha. So if I come to the summary of what we have learned so far, so we have uh, looked at this uh, waves and oscillation in Al ALMA, ALMA data. For the first time, we have been looking at this temperature variation. We have been able to detect this uh, excess temperature up to 2000 Kelvin in very short time scale. We could not observe those if we didn't have this very high temporal cadence, if we could not have this direct measurement of the temperature that ALMA can do. So it's been shown that uh, they are good signatures of the shock waves. Mm -hmm. So they have been studied also from the simulation as I showed earlier. So we have also looked at this high frequency oscillation in small scale structures in the chromosphere. So then very high frequency and these are the periods of different uh, parameters like temperature, horizontal velocity and size. So we can see is order of 60 to uh, 100 uh, seconds. And we found this uh, sausage mode and kink mode because of this anti-correlation between the brightness temperature and size and then fast sausage mode found in this feature, also king mode due to the, um, to the horizontal velocities. We have looked at the overall oscillations in this, in this observation, the best observations so far from ALMA. So we have found uh, both presence and lack of oscillatory signals that you would expect in the chromosphere. So there are many different scenarios that we have uh, been discussing. Uh, about. So the umbrella effect that is covering uh, the whole area is one of the probably in the strongest uh, scenario, but we have also considered different scenarios that could explain it, but still this question would, is open and we need them I mean, to look, at, look into it uh, using simulation to be able to answer it. But what's important here, the message is Alma has brought us uh, new capabilities 
to be able to look at these waves and oscillation in the solar chromosphere. Thank you very much. That's it for me. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shahim. I'm Diego, a PhD.